Efendim bu panelde moderatörümüz Erdinç Yılmaz olacak. Sözü ona bırakıyorum. Çok teşekkür ederim. Ee, öncelikle Sine Filozofi Dergisi 5. Uluslararası Sinema Felsefi Sempozyumu'na e, hoş geldiniz demek istiyorum. E, i̇lk konuşmacıyı e, sunmaktan dolayı da ne kadar mutlu olduğumu e, belirtmek isterim. Kendisi e, Dr. Sinir Brink. Alana e, son derece büyük katkılar sağlamış bir e, hoca kendisi. E, birazdan e, İngilizce sunuma geçeceğiz. Bir tanıtım yapacağım ardından da e, Robert Sinir Brink konuşmasına başlayacak. E, dilerseniz ona da bir hoş geldiniz diyelim. Dear guests, welcome to the Journal of Cine Philosophy, the fifth international symposium on cinema and philosophy. I'm so honored to announce our first uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Sinir Brink. He will make a speech with the title A Dialogue on the Future of Film, uh, Film Philosophy. But first, allow me to introduce him to you. Robert Sinerbrink is Associate Professor of uh, Philosophy and ARC Future Fellowship recipient. As an undergraduate, he studied medicine, creative writing, film, and philosophy. He received first class honors and the university uh, medal in philosophy before being awarded his PhD on Hegel, Heidegger, and the metaphysics of modernity at the University of Sydney in 2002. As a postgraduate, he spent uh, six months studying at the Humboldt uh, Universidad in Berlin. After returning to Australia, he taught uh, philosophy at a number of institutions, including the University of Sydney, uh, at UTS, UNSW, the College of Fine Arts, and the Macquarie University. Before joining the Macquarie, uh, the Macquarie Department of Philosophy in July 2002, Robert's research areas of interest include aesthetics, philosophy of film, phenomenology, critical theory, Heidegger, and social philosophy. His current research explores the intersection between philosophy and cinema with a focus on the cinematic ethics, the philosophical potential of cinema as a medium of ethical experience. He is also a prolific writer who has numerous books, uh, New Philosophies of Film, Thinking Images, and Cinematic Ethics, Exploring Ethical Experience Through Film, are examples of his magnificent works. And plus, he is uh, a great person. <coughs> All right, uh, Professor Sinebrin, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right, I will, I will give, give the word to you, and uh, I want to state that I am so pleased to have met you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just trying to play my camera. I don't know if that's um, visible or, or not. You can see me. All right, right now we can't see you. No. So. Yeah, it just says, uh, the host can stop the camera, I don't know if that's intentional or, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So shall I just proceed then, or? No, we, can we can't, on? there is no camera, I, I don't know. Um, when I press the unmute of the camera, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it, so I'm not sure. Uh, let's see if uh, um, yeah, so I can unmute my microphone, but not start the video, it just says the host is muted. Yes. Yeah. So is it possible to unmute my camera or um, open up my camera from your end? We can hear you, but actually uh, the sound is not very really healthy, so yeah. we cannot understand what you are saying really yeah. well. Uh, hopefully that would be a bit better. Is that a bit louder? Yeah. That's better? It's better yeah. now, yeah. It's be okay, all right. Um, that, that's okay, well, I guess if there's no camera, um, I should just proceed in any case. Um, well, I first of all want to say thank you very much for the uh, very kind of and very generous uh, introduction. I, I really appreciate it. I wanted to thank my hosts uh, and the uh, Sydney Philosophy uh, conference organizing team and editorial team. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this conference, uh, you know, even if just virtually. I would have liked to have been there, of course, in person, but I'm um, really uh, happy to be involved and in presenting this, uh, this keynote. Now, I did have a, um, a PowerPoint uh, slide which just has some text on it which might be useful for the audience to see. Is it possible to share that? 
Actually, we, uh, we, can't, we still can't see you. We are trying to see. figure out what the problem is, but... Yeah. So, I'm just looking at my video settings. My camera's okay, my end. Um, I'm just not sure why it's not... Um, Actually, you maybe you can start your uh, speech, yes. and then we we will try to figure out what the problem is yeah. about. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. Okay. All right, well, Thank look, you. I will make a start. Um, my idea for this presentation was to basically present a dialogue, a dialogue of the future of film philosophy, and it's really uh, responding to uh, my most recent book, uh, which does conclude with a chapter on uh, which this talk is based, uh, a dialogue on the future of film philosophy. And I thought this might be an interesting way of exploring some of the questions and issues that uh, I examine in my book, but also, and I think, a very important or contemporary film philosophy, and thinking about future directions of film philosophy. And I think this is very much uh, what your conference is uh, focusing on as well. So I'll just make a start. I do have a slide, a slide presentation. Um, I don't know if I can share it from my end uh, because I'm reading my text now. But in any case, if you do get the camera along the way, that, that would be uh, that would be wonderful. So I'll just make a start. In my book, New Philosophies of Film: An Introduction to Cinema as a Way of Thinking, published by the newsroom last year. I discuss contemporary approaches to the philosophy of film and explore the idea of film philosophy. I focused on the question whether film can do philosophy that is contribute to our philosophical understanding via cinematic means. I also examined the debate over film as philosophy, which I suggest is better understood as exploring how cinema and accompany philosophy engage in mutually transformative encounters guided by the idea of cinematic thinking. I explore this idea by focusing on three cinematic case studies. Two philosophical documentaries that came with each other, one of the philosopher Jacques Derrida, uh, the first one being the film Derrida by Kirby Dick and Amy Zurich Coffin in 2002, and Daya Derrida, or Derrida's Elsewhere, by the Egyptian filmmaker and poet Safa Fati from 1949. I also looked at Lars von Trier's film Coffin in 2011, and the acclaimed BBC Netflix television series by Mirror, Charlie Brooker, uh, all of which are a few aesthetically challenging examples of how we might approach cinema and television as a medium of philosophical and ethical experience. My aim is to create a space of dialogue and encounter between film and philosophy, offering new ways of thinking through both. Film from the perspective of philosophy, and philosophy from the perspective of film, an approach that might contribute to our philosophical understanding and ethical experience. There are nonetheless three significant challenges for philosophy of film and film philosophy arising from contemporary developments, which I noted throughout my book. The first one is the digital revolution, that has put the traditional conception of the medium, that is film, into question. The second are the cultural political developments around identity politics including critiques of Eurocentrism, colonialism, and so back at the centre of film theoretical debate. And the third is the challenge to extend the film's philosophy debate into other domains of cinema, like documentary, television, animation, and digital media, and to do so without production, circularity, or selection bias. In response to these challenges, particularly the, the latter one, we would do better, I suggest, to recast the film's philosophy debate in more pluralistic terms, concerning what counts as philosophy as well as what counts as film, emphasizing the potential of cinema to serve as a medium of philosophical and ethical experience, which is what I'm calling the idea of cinematic thinking. I attempted to deal with these issues in my book, but having reached its conclusion, I recognize that there would be critics who may be convinced by the film's philosophy idea my question from the philosophy of cultures I discussed, or who reject the idea of cinematic thinking. Instead of rehearsing and repeating the arguments and debates I examined throughout my book, 
I thought it would be more interesting to imagine a dialogue on the future of John philosophy, which these questions could be explored in an abbreviated way by several voices to Dr. Nagas points of view to verify the utopia. These are represented by a digital utopia, the EU, the EU, a philosopher of film, Pierre, a film philosopher, FP, an advocate of identity politics, IP, and a skeptical cultural theorist, CT. As in any philosophical dialogue, the aim is not necessarily to arrive at a definitive answer or conclusion, but to deepen our understanding, clarify problems, conceptualize how to think through them, and open up new perspectives that might transform our horizons and shift our ways of thinking. Okay, so I might just briefly, um, since I've got these slides here with me, unfortunately, I don't have the camera there, uh, I don't know what work because I can't share the, uh, the slides on this side. Oh, the camera there. Okay, never mind, I shall press on. Okay, so basically what I have now is five different voices or characters uh, posing questions and having a discussion around this topic future of human philosophy. So, the first topic or the first challenge, the digital revolution and the future of human philosophy. So here's a question from one of the characters, the digital utopia. Here's the question. You have given us an illuminating overview of the new philosophical theories of film, including the film's philosophy of light. But these theories still treat film as though it were a living medium. When we talk of film, concept that is both historically obsolete and technologically succeeded when we are currently in the digital age and the medium of the film has been replaced by digital image-making practices. Similar to still the film is today, so-called, using digital cameras, composed using digital editing software, routinely incorporates animation and CGI techniques and is subjected to a host of digital post-production processes. How can we still talk of film theory when this medium, as Dean Quadwick observes, as I will hear about later, no doubt, has been deprived of its object? Much as I am intrigued by the new philosophers of film, they appear to be in the parlous position of philosophizing on an obsolete medium. They have barely begun to revise their ontology of film in light of the shift to digital culture, let alone the emancipatory potentials of digital utopianism. Stanley Carell follows Andre Bazin in realizing, and sorry, in theorizing a realist ontology of cinema, while Jim Deleuze, who at least recognized the significance of digital images, remains focused on traditional forms of movement and time in cinema. Film philosophers, from what I can see, remain skeptical or resistant towards the liberating possibilities of digital technology. What should philosophy of film do in response to the digital revolution? So that's the first question. First response by the philosopher of film. Now, as a philosopher of film, someone trained in film theory, but who embraced the new philosophers of film, as an alternative to so called grand theory, I agree we need to take the digital revolution seriously. It's true that most philosophers of film have paid little attention to the challenges raised by the digital revolution and do not give enough attention to how we should describe but also philosophize about film in the digital age. That's why many philosophers of film, like Noel Carroll, Carl Plantinger, and others, claim that we should talk of moving images or screen stories rather than film to loosen the grip of the old term film in our thinking and to shift to a more contemporary and expansive conception of this audiovisual medium. Others argue that we can continue to use the word uh, film or particularly cinema in an expanded sense in order to encompass the digital images. Despite these technological transformations, linguistic usage, moreover, is slow to change, and historical origins or legacy is in many terms do not preclude their acquisition of new meanings. Film production processes have changed dramatically, as has the circulation and consumption of cinema by multiple digital platforms involving different viewing practices. From the old fashioned, shared, yet solitary viewing experience in the and cinema theatre, to watching streamed television shows on your mobile phone while commuting to work. Narrative cinema or screen stories are certainly produced and consumed differently, yet they remain as they have been continuous with earlier forms of mainstream film and movies. Despite obvious features such as the incorporation of CGI technology, 
Uh, Dr. Sinebrink, uh, so, sorry for interrupting, but uh, are you displaying any uh, PowerPoint presentation right now? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, are you displaying any uh, PowerPoint presentation right now? No, not right huh. now. I'm not reading right. from ah, the okay. text. I do have a All PowerPoint right. which I forwarded, uh -huh. uh, which I can All right. forward. Alright, sorry um, for interrupting. That could be, yeah, that's, that's the one uh -huh. that I think is Okay. Thank you. That, that's fine. Uh, when, when you start doing the uh, PowerPoint presentation, we will see it, I'm sure. Okay. Please. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the only thing is because my camera is not visible, anything I share is not visible either. So, so um, uh, I did have a PowerPoint presentation. I could reset that, I, I, I suppose. Um, if that would come, I could probably do that in the chat. Um, perhaps here. Uh, that's fine, actually, because we uh, we weren't sure if you were displaying any uh, presentation or not. That's why I asked. But you can continue, please. Yeah. Okay. No, no problem. Good. All right. So uh, just the end of that response. There are new possibilities of the medium thanks to the advent of digital images. But as Stephen Prince suggests, there's also a deep continuity with the older paradigm of film narrative. Cinema remains the overwhelmingly narrative medium that has not changed appreciably. The ports of the death of film, thanks to the digital image, are greatly exaggerated. So that's the first response. Second response by the film philosopher, Peter P. I agree with Pierre about the need to rethink our assumptions in light of the digital revolution, and that we should give more attention to the ontology of digital images and examine how they differ from analog images. It is also true that contemporary narrative cinema is expanding in its possibilities in technical and production senses, but not radically altered in aesthetic terms. How planting this term screen story is, is an apt way of describing how narrative cinema has not changed dramatically despite the digital revolution. As a film philosopher, however, I want to say a few words defending the relevance of Cavell's and Deleuze's philosophical work on cinema in the digital age. Now, Cavell, to be sure, does focus on what we might call the analog phase of film history, and he did not write much concerning the shift to digital images and filmmaking practices. At the same time, he did write on television and a bit on animation. At the same time, this account of the media refers to the aesthetic performances and artistic possibilities that a new medium leaves for us to discover or to invent, which is surely what we have seen today in recent cinema and animation. In the wake of the image skepticism that pervades contemporary culture, the idea that digital images mean, for example, that there's no such thing as truth or objectivity, or raises doubts about the intersubjective consensus to find social reality, the influence of fake news, deep fake simulations and the like. In light of all of that, the problem of scepticism, whether epistemic or moral, has become more relevant than ever. Canal's philosophical approach to cinema, moving images in whatever form, by the problematique of scepticism, has taken on a new lease of life. The pervasive cultural scepticism towards truth, towards reason, artistic achievement, ethical responsibility, and the role of images in the cinema in response to this skepticism makes it crucial for the philosophy of film to respond to the ethical challenges raised by contemporary audiovisual culture. There are also aesthetic reasons to defend Gavel's philosophical engagement with cinema. Some of the most interesting filmmakers today have explored the stylistic possibilities of digital images in dialogue with various filming traditions in ways that suggest we need to think of the medium in terms of aesthetic performances and artistic possibilities rather than in terms of any virtual substrates or technological mediation or so-called essential defining properties. Think of Terence Malick's use of GoPro footage in his recent films like Light of Cups, or Steven Soderbergh's iPhone films like Unsane in 2018, or Jonathan Calvert's remarkable personal documentary, The Nation, an assemblage of found Super 8 footage, VHS videotape, photograph montages, and answering phone messages. Whatever philosophical dimensions there are to contemporary digital cinema, we should remain attentive to and engaged with the aesthetic possibilities of new digital media, including expressions of virtual reality and their capacities to transform the medium in conversation. 
We can say much the same for Gilles Deleuze. Along with John Carroll, he was one of the few philosophers who have recognized early on the importance of the digital revolution, not to mention the importance of the brain and body to philosophical engagement. As he counted the shock to thought that art can engender, how an affective, perceptual, and longly encounter with images can force us to think, is highly relevant to the challenges raised by digital media and related developments like VR technology, for example, virtual reality technology. His insistence on the capacity of cinema to create images and solicit new ways of experiencing time, affect, and thought, the great and given frames of representation, and thereby provoke us to think, remains profoundly important in the digital age. Think, for example, of the interest in experimental television, for instance, Sandy Beckett's television plays. For these reasons, many film philosophers have been thinking with Cabral and Deleuze, but also against Cabral and Deleuze, who open up new forms of film philosophical thinking in response to contemporary audiovisual culture. There is no reason why we should continue to rehearse or repeat Deleuze's own concepts and analyses when it is more in the spirit of Deleuzean cinema philosophy to create new concepts in response to mutations in the medium and the challenge of the digital that is transforming the meaning and possibilities of cinema. Think of Patricia Pista's work in this respect, it would be a great example. At the same time, I think we should remain critical towards the ambiguous potentials of digital and social media and the effects of the profound technological transformation of social reality today. As Heidegger once observed, the point is not to denounce technology as an evil force, the work of the devil, nor to uncritically celebrate while remaining blind to its dangers, but rather to think through technology in order to find a more ethically free manner of inhabiting a technologically disclosed world. This is how philosophically oriented cinema and television, like the Black Mirror television series, for example, and ethical philosophy, uh, ethical film philosophy together can contribute to a cultural politics. Such works not only offer a shock to thought, but also an invitation to explore cinema as a way of thinking unequal to a technologically mediated sense of reality. Okay, so the second challenge to uh, film philosophy, philosophy of film and cultural politics. So here's a question from the identity politics theorist, IMP. Here's the question. What strikes me about both philosophers of film and film philosophers is that they seem to predicate their philosophical engagement with cinema by passing over or marginalizing cultural politics, whether by the analytic cognitivist critique of grand theory, Cavell's focus on skepticism, or Deleuze's focus on developing a Bergsonian and Persian metaphysical and semiotic typology of movement and time images, philosophical engagement with cinema seems to sideline the more radical political traditions informing the film or screen theory. As we know, these traditions foregrounded the central role of ideology and the ways in which film theory contributed to demystifying the media and exposing the mechanisms of power that construct dominant and subordinate subject positions according to the axes of class, gender, and so on. Film theorists today are renewing these debates in light of the return to identity politics and hence refocusing their attention on gender, race, the critique of coloniality, Eurocentrism, white supremacy, and so on, to name some key fronts in what, for better or worse, was formerly called the culture wars. Would you not say that philosophers of film and film philosophers should be focusing more on identity politics, or at least the ways in which ideology remains important in contemporary cinema? Thus, doing philosophy of film and film philosophy preclude so, first response from the philosopher of film here. The critique of grand theory did come about during the volatile period in film studies, in which at times it did take on the cultural force aspect, although Polemic's memory seemed to go in both directions, thinking of the lively exchanges between Stephen Heath and Mark Carroll, for example. Still, there is a misconception today that analytic cognitive film theory is apolitical, or unconcerned with social and political issues somehow blind to ideology. Much depends, of course, on what one means by politics here, which has many meanings in contemporary debates. What film and cultural theorists mean by politics in an expanded sense may be quite different from what political philosophers, let alone political theorists, mean by the term. Early 
volumes by Emily Kaufman of Spears, like Mara Smith and Richard Allen say, in the late 90s, included discussions of ideology, subjectivity, and politics, including critiques of the Brechtian paradigm of film theory. This has not remained the focus of Emily Kaufman's approaches, to be sure, but that is not to say we cannot gain anything from these approaches for understanding norms of ideological dimensions. Contemporary cognitivists, especially pluralists, have contributed to understanding, affect, and emotional engagement with film. Our Platinum is a good example. This seems to me a key component in how ideology gets a grip on individual and group subjectivity. It's uh, not for nothing that today we talk of the politics of fear, for example, in regard to right wing extremism, or the insidious appeal of fake news, the influence of conspiracy theories in culture and in politics. This means that we need to understand how audiovisual images match the culture of attention, channel and direct affect and emotion, and shift attitudes and beliefs in ways that are ethically and politically significant. Audiovisual propaganda does not work by appealing to the, quote, unforced force of the better argument, to use Jürgen Habermas' phrase, but rather by the force of images, power of affect, the links between emotion and cognition, between perception, emotion, and action. That is one way that philosophy of cinema, including cognitive film theory, can contribute to our understanding of ethical, political, and ideological concerns. Second response from the film philosopher F.P. I agree that we need to think through the cinema in relation to its ethical, political, and ideological dimensions, and that this remains a challenge for contemporary film philosophy. That's why I made a point a moment ago about how philosophy can contribute to cultural politics in relation to cinema. I think we need to be careful, though, not to set up a false opposition between philosophical engagement in cinema and political forms of theory and the explicit activist orientation. I think you can see this with Camille Deleuze, for example, whose work has always had a strongly ethical orientation and implicit political dimension, which both remain closely integrated with their respective philosophical concerns. Think of Cavell's exploration of moral perfectionism and his focus on the conditions of democratic life, or his reflections in his book Cities of Words on how popular cinema can engage traditions of political philosophy in narrative terms, as explored further in Richard Rushman's book on Hollywood cinema and politics, for example. It is true that Cavell's attention is directed towards American cinema and politics, and there is much to be said here concerning gender, race, and other aspects of identity politics. Cavell always argued, however, that we need to maintain an openness to conversation and dialogue with others that is paramount to any philosophical engagement with film, lest we revert to a militant and moralizing paradigm of discursive warfare, according to which my interlocutor is an enemy, an evil other to be denounced, rather than a partner in dialogue from whom I might learn. Deleuze, too, has a strongly ethical focus in his cinema books, in his insistence that cinema has a creative capacity to articulate thought relevant to the contemporary world, to his engagement with cinema as a response to nihilism and the means of providing reasons to believe in this world. There is also Deleuze's more explicitly political exploration of minor cinema, with a political focus on marginalized, subjugated, and or colonized peoples who find in their impossible conditions of subjugation the tools to create cinema with the potential for creating a new mode of existence, while at the same time critically resisting the intolerable status quo imposed by different forms of social and cultural domination. And then there are Deleuze's remarks on the society of control, which resonate powerfully today and have been taken up by filmmakers and theorists concerned with the dangers posed by the rise of what Shoshana Zuboff surveillance capitalism. Again, think of Black Mirror as a, a great similar example of this kind of exploration. Now, I'm not saying that these two thinkers, Camille and Deleuze, have all the answers, but the response to the philosophical, ethical, and political questions raised by cinema are, to my mind, worth the time, the life of the life, to reflect upon and understand. Many contemporary film philosophers are exploring in a critical and creative manner how to move beyond Deleuze's drawing on the conceptual tools from my climbing his work in order to respond to the cultural, political, and ethical challenges we face in our globalized world. I think of your work of all of our keynotes, David Roderick, Richard Listers, David Martin Jones, and Richard Rushton, for example. 
Again, we can take our cue from filmmakers in a world full of cinemas, as Danny Martin Jones puts it, whose aesthetically complex and politically committed works provoke and express thought in ways that are both philosophically productive and can be politically resistant. When it comes to politicizing our philosophy, we should let a thousand flowers bloom, to use an old slogan. We should welcome a plurality of philosophical perspectives to take up whatever concepts or philosophical approaches that might help us engage with contemporary cultural politics, but in ways that remain open and constructive, creative and critical, rather than being dogmatic, sectarian, or doctrinaire. That said, I would add that we should avoid falling into the trap of reductively instrumentalizing cinema as no more than a vehicle for ideology. This is important whether we are critiquing the ethical, cultural, racial, or political biases of a particular film, or promoting the moral and pedagogical benefits of marginalized, radical, or overtly cultural political works. The interplay between aesthetic and ethical political dimensions of cinema and television remains an irreducible feature of their aesthetic complexity and expression of meaning, a point that contemporary film philosophers would be wise to acknowledge. Okay, the third challenge now, cinematic thinking. It is philosophical cherry-picking or transformative thinking. That's the challenge. Here's cultural theorist at CT putting the question to us. These are fine words from you both, and I applaud the sentiment behind them. But many, many philosophers still have doubts about the so-called moral, strong versions of the film's possible thesis. That is, the idea that cinema can contribute in an original and significant manner to philosophical understanding by exclusively cinematic means. It is difficult but not impossible to show how cinematic works can contribute in an original manner to philosophical and ethical understanding or even to political change. And I don't see how we can make such bold claims without raising the distinction between philosophy and film, or indeed philosophy and art, in ways that are implausible or questionable. Those do not, in the philosophical sense, offer arguments or give reasons or make theoretical generalizations, although I do grant that they can be regarded as thought experiments or complex examples for further philosophical reflection. But this is to admit only the moderate version of the film's philosophical thesis, but still there is a moral version in advance. Now, I don't wish to rehearse these arguments here, but I would like to raise a related issue which chimes with the previous question. Why do philosophers of film and film philosophers tend to focus on narrative film, whether it's popular, world cinema, art house cinema, etc., rather than other forms of cinema, say like documentary, or for that matter, television? Don't we need to expand what film philosophy means to encompass television, documentary, digital media, and so on? Now, the author has made some initial forays in these directions, but the question remains. Have philosophers of film and film philosophers focused on particular kinds of narrative film in order to cherry pick, selectively um, uh, pick examples that would fit or confirm the uh, film's philosophy thesis? Isn't this a circular or question begging form of argument, what Wartenberg, Tom Wartenberg, that is, sometimes calls the imposition objection, recalling the very flaw from which grand theorists were criticized? Do we really need philosophy in order to engage with cinema? What can philosophy add to our cultural understanding of film and other audiovisual media? So, first response to that film philosophy. Okay. That's an important and challenging question. I would say the film philosophy approach emphasizes the importance of our aesthetic experience of film, defending whatever theoretical claims one might make with reference to the film and so called readings of films that one offers. The author, as I understand it, is guided here by Stephen Mulhall's idea of the priority of the particular, namely that in aesthetics or philosophy of art, we need to foreground the world of particular cases of individual works that provide philosophical evidence, so to speak, or aesthetic corroboration supporting our theoretical claims. As he discusses in his book, the claims made in film philosophy cannot be decided purely on theoretical grounds, but require Develops and argues recourse to philosophical film criticism, that is, the testing of one's aesthetic experience with particular films via philosophical interpretation and critical reflection. Like the author, in my own work, I also draw on Deleuze's claim that cinema can enact a shocked thought, that it 
forms a cinematic thinking in the images that challenges and resists philosophy, provoking us to think in response to what film enables us to experience, without, however, reducing cinema to a mere reflection of an assumed philosophical framework. Taken together, these Cavalian and Deleuzean ideas present guides to forming what the author sometimes calls romantic film philosophy. The author goes on to discuss a variety of examples, two independent philosophical documentaries about the life of thought of a philosopher, for instance, an art cinema crossover or generically hybrid film, like Colia, and an innovative dystopian television series, like Mirror. Surely that is some attempt at expanding and diversifying what counts as film philosophy. Now, a further question from the identity politics theorists, IP. That's all very well, but I still feel that you are avoiding my question about identity politics in film. What about the identity politics of which films we choose to discuss? Which filmmakers are deemed worthy of philosophy? Which traditions or subjectivities, including identities, genders, races, sexualities, and so on, are excluded from philosophical consideration? Don't these issues play an important, even central role in film philosophy today? Moreover, by choosing philosophical documentaries or articles, the author is skewing the film philosophy relationship in favour of philosophy by avoiding, in typically, elitist fashion, dealing with popular genres and forms from diverse contexts. Such elitism simply reproduces the kind of philosophical disenfranchisement of film and its attendant cultural, racial, and autonomous biases that the author claims can be overturned by the film philosophy approach. Even if you were able to show that some films can do philosophy, this would not show that film in general can be philosophical, which is presumably what philosophical readings of popular genres and films intend to show. Nor would it address the demand for diversity as a central criterion for defining what should count as philosophy in the first place. So, a response from the philosopher of Carl Pierre. These are important points and have certainly become central again in contemporary film theory debates, which have been marked by a return to ideology, not so much in relation to class politics or the critique of capitalism, as in the past, but more in relation to cultural politics and the critique of colonialism. There is no question that the philosophical canon remains overwhelmingly masculinist and Anglo or Eurocentric in character and it is certainly an important issue to address critically and to shift over time. The impetus of this, I suggest, often comes from the ladies themselves, who are typically at the forefront of these cultural political struggles and making films that portray diverse, non-European, post-colonial and marginalised perspectives from dominant or hegemonic ways of representing and experiencing social reality. A film I just saw in Berlin recently, the Afrofuturist science fiction and musical Neptune Frost by American writer Saul Williams and his partner, filmmaker Anicia Huseyma, is a case in point, filmed in Rwanda and Burundi. That said, I would be wary of producing films as artistic and philosophical works to a crude reflection of the filmmakers, audience, or critics' identity or social or cultural context, or reducing them to ideologically correct narratives designed to re engineer dominant modes of consciousness. Historical attempts to instrumentalize cinema in this fashion have usually failed or backfired. If anything, cinema enables the decentering of subjectivity and identity in ways that are conducive to a more fluid, pluralistic, differentiated, and plastic sense of identity, actually much better if it's viewed as difference. Uh, and it does this perhaps more successfully than many other contemporary art forms. Cinema as an art is plastic and transformative rather than rigid and prescriptive. In the defense of the author, however, I would say that there is no reason to assume that Vaughan's philosophy thesis must be a fully generalizable claim. Indeed, there may well be only select instances of filmmaking that elicit a suitably philosophical ethical response or that count as cases of cinematic thinking. Like aesthetic value, philosophical value may be an evaluative rather than an objective property of individual works. That is to say, more a matter of experiencing, interpreting, and analyzing works in certain ways uh, than detecting or defining some pre-existing property in the minute. Now, another question from the cultural theorist CT. In a related vein, I wanted to ask, ask you both, Pierre and David P, about the author's approach.
language in his book, which I understand is an attempt to model how one might go about philosophical engagement with film, or how one might do film philosophy. Both these same issues, the challenge of the digital, the question of identity politics, and the problem of how to engage with cinema philosophically in ways that are not reductive or anachronistic, circular or biased, both these same problems arise in the author's book. As Martin Rousseau has recently argued in his book, Transformational Ethics of Film, Thinking of the Cinema Makeover in the Film Philosophy of Fate, was published last year by Brill, don't film philosophers rely on the tacit model of transformative ethics that shapes their otherwise ungrounded claims that films can do philosophy, or more boldly, that films can even transform our ways of thinking or even our ethical modes of existence? So, a response from film philosophy. Thank you for your insightful question about the film philosophy approach. For my own part, and in defense of the author's book, I would admit there is a degree of elitism, so called, uh, which I take to be a moralizing accusation, though, rather than a philosophical objection, a degree of elitism in choosing certain films rather than others. Exercising one's own aesthetic or philosophical tastes cannot help but be so. This is an elitism, however, that is plural and open ended and elitism of artistic and philosophical achievement rather than one of pernicious ideological exclusion. Excellence in cinematic art can be achieved in many ways, in many styles, and in many genres. In popular romance, as much as experimental film, in horror, as much as documentary, self-reflective art film, as much as action or sci-fi genres, in digital cinema, as in serial television. Nonetheless, as Cadell remarks, films that contain the condition of film as their subject tend to enjoy an inherent philosophical advantage or greater degree of self-understanding than other less self-aware or self-questioning works. It is understandable that films inviting the viewer to think, to feel, and to question should have their invitations accepted. I would add that there is also an ethical decision at stake in devoting time and thought to films or television shows that question established conventions and that experiment with evoking new ways of thinking and feeling. In a global cultural and economic marketplace, dominated by certain types of stories or ideological points of view, there is an ethical purpose in devoting attention to the more marginal, more questioning, more aesthetically demanding films that one encounters. This is one reason, I assume, why the author discusses two lesser known philosophical documentaries. Although documentary film has become popular in recent years, documentaries focusing on philosophers themselves remain an intriguing, less known, but also innovative subject that offer ideal cases for exploring the film and philosophy relationship. Now, another question or response from the cultural theorist, CT. I can see why these examples would be good ones for the argument of the book and why they can be defended on philosophical grounds. But isn't there still a degree of arbitrariness or cherry picking in the kinds of film, whether they're traditional, popular, televisual, archives, or digital, that we choose to? Us philosophically in our work. Can we ever escape the imposition objection, that is, that philosophers impose rather than find philosophical meaning in films? And if not, shouldn't we admit to our privileges, to our biases and blind spots more readily? Response by the philosopher of film appears. These are important questions getting to the heart of what philosophers think they are doing when they engage with cinema. As you noted earlier, the moderate version of the film's philosophy thesis is now widely accepted, even though the small critics of this approach uh, are you know, still uh, unconvinced. The bold version, of course, is still controversial, with debate continuing as to its coherence and plausibility. The author, as you may know, thinks one can defend a bold version of this idea by wearing the concept of cinematic thinking, the idea that cinema can serve as a medium of philosophical and ethical experience. Indeed, one, can, uh, one way you can defend the idea of film, contributing to philosophical understanding, he argues, is via the cinematic experience that we can have that may foster the imaginative reordering of beliefs, questioning of assumptions, or shifting of philosophical perspectives. Cinema's, cinema does not generally introduce radically new ideas or profoundly re educate, or for that matter, manipulate viewers. But it can remind us of what we think we know. It can clarify but also probe or query our intuitions and beliefs. And it can enable us to reorder and refine our thinking, particularly concerning moral beliefs and attitudes, 
in ways that are philosophically significant and cognitively productive. This is what analytic philosophy is about, called aesthetic cognitivism. These forms of affective and cognitive experience, essential, for example, engaging in cinematic thought experiments, may be one way of explaining how films can be philosophical in ways specific to the medium, and thus offer support for the bold version of the film's philosophy thesis. Now, a response from the film philosopher theory. I agree with my colleague, but want to answer from a different perspective. I think that these criticisms of philosophical approaches to cinema, that they are elitist, biased, cherry-picking, or circular, are understandable but also misguided. Here I can only agree with the PF's responses regarding the potential of cinema to enhance, refine, and extend our philosophical and ethical understanding. We can have philosophical and ethical experiences in cinema. If film philosophers are responding to the aesthetic, moral, and philosophical experiences that certain films can elicit, then it is not surprising that they appear to cherry pick films that are conducive to both eliciting and expressing this kind of philosophical and ethical engagement. From this point of view, film philosophers are not engaging in a questionable imposition of their philosophical views. Rather, they are responding in a conceptual manner to the varieties of philosophical and ethical experience that cinema makes possible for us. One suggestion, then, is that we should shift the ground of the debate focusing more on cinema as a philosophical and ethical experience. This is one way of recasting what cinema can do. It can both express and elicit experiences of cinematic thinking, which depend upon the ways in which aesthetic, imaginative, and emotional engagement that cinematic works can open up new paths of thinking, perhaps even new ways of being. For these reasons, I think we need to recall that audio visual works of art, like all art, not only offers experiences that are pleasurable or fascinating, wondrous and absorbing, disturbing and arousing. They can also provoke and express thought in ways that force us to think and feel outside of our habitual routines and stereotypical regimes. Cinema can reveal and express the world anew, offering ways of thinking and feeling that are urgently required in our troubled and troubling world. The brain even offers us, offer us experiences with ethically transformative power. If that sounds too speculative or romantic, which it probably is, all I can say is that it recalls one of the most admirable ways I know of thinking about art and beauty. I mean the idea that cinema, like beauty, offers us only the promise of happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sebi. <laughs> that, that was a detailed and uh, enlightened, enlightening talk. Thank you for that. Uh, actually, you responded a lot of our, uh, a lot of our questions, and uh, we just have one question. Uh, we live in a time that when reality is questioned and personalized, cinema experiments on reality and blends it with fiction in its own terms, both in documentary and fiction. Do you think this blurred line between reality and fiction poses a threat against the ethics of cinema? Or on the contrary, it is a blessing in terms of giving way to philosophical thinking. Dr. Sinebring, are you still there? Um, yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> sorry for, sorry for the misconnection. Uh, I'm repeating the question. We, we live in a time when reality is questioned and personalized. Cinema experiments on reality and blends it with fiction in its own terms, both in documentary and fiction. Uh, do you think this blurred line between reality and fiction possesses a threat against the ethics of cinema? Or on the contrary, it is a blessing in terms of giving way to philosophical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a very important question and very much um, at the heart of a lot of what I was discussing, exploring in this dialogue. So um, I think that's always been one of the fascinating and for some people disturbing potentials of cinema. It has the capacity to, and, and think about the history of film theory and film production here as well. 
the capacity for collaborating fantasy and exploring imaginative worlds, but also the capacity for capturing reality and giving a very realistic sense of consciousness and perception of, of the way the world is. And it can do both. The capacity for fantasy and the capacity for realistic representation. So that blurred boundary is inherent to the media. It's both what makes possible you know, the extraordinary flourishing of uh, fictional narrative cinema, but it also makes possible you know, traditions of realism, but also of documentary and uh, non-fiction art. So it is something inherent to uh, part of the potential of the medium. Um, so I think the ethical question, both for filmmakers and also for you know, the, the culture generally, is both how we uh, approach film, how we make sense of it, how films are made, for what purposes, um, how audiences are, I suppose, educated to uh, receive and respond to, to cinema. One of the big challenges today, and I think this is one of the issues I try to raise in the debate, and concerns the sort of skeptical issues arising, particularly around digital images today, because um, a lot of the more traditional ways of thinking about cinema, about photography and analog images, uh, does rest on the idea of certain realism, a certain link between the image and uh, some uh, objective in social or external reality. Um, whereas with digital images, we're dealing with a mathematical model, uh, a simulation rather than a, a, a representation in that more analog sense. So the whole question of the link between images and reality is a very live and important issue for us today. I think cinema has a, a very important role to play here in exploring, examining, reflecting on, even uh, critiquing the ways in which images can be used and understood, uh, the way they both shape our sense of social reality but can also distort our sense of social reality. And I think there are many examples of filmmakers and television series I mentioned like Mira that explore this question. So I think that uh, issue of a blurred boundary is, is both a potential for cinematic exploration and cinematic art, but it's also uh, an important ethical and cultural concern about uh, our way of understanding and relating to images and how they link with, with social reality. So uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Thank you, that was a great response and we, are all, uh, we all appreciate that. And uh, I think we are running out of time, that's why uh, we need to end the uh, session here. But uh, thank you for coming and hope to meet you in person someday and have a great day. Thank you very much, I really uh, appreciate the session and the invitation. I hope the conference goes extremely well, I will try and tune in when I can. As you can hear, there's an enthusiastic crowd here, so they all appreciate that too. Thank you and have a nice day. See you. Thank you very much.